Now, let us move on to the second topic for today on the application of PLS SCM in research. Next. Since Prof Shelf has served as guest editor for several IS journals, could you share with us what are the three advices you would give to the scholars or me who use PLS SCM in their analysis and wish to publish in top tier journals? The floor is yours. Okay, thanks again. It's my pleasure to share that my experience here. And I really appreciate the Marco. Marco, hi. And we did a special issue in the internet research. We spent a lot of time and with the uh, Joe Hale and I'm the review manager. So I can see all of the papers go through the every detail. The top five reasons to reject it in the special issue. The first one is the outdated mediation and the modulation. We know most of the research use the pattern candy in 1986, but it's a paradigm, of course, but now it's outdated. We should use the new one. And if we have time, I can deduce more. The second one is the, of course, I we did the uh, IS the journal. So, so many submissions, they use the 10 related issues, but now, that it is hard to find a new research about the ten model. So, and our suggestion is to forget about the ten model here. The third one is the model that misses specification, the reflect and the formative. That if you you model the wrong ones, then we reject you, and include the second order that and more complex. The first one is the contribution. If your contribution is not clear, then we reject your paper. The last one is the hypothesis and testing. It must be consistent. Next one. My second part, uh, the experience is not only for uh, the special issue. There's uh, for the uh, most of the journal as the A and S E right now. I reviewed so many the. Uh, paper they submit to the journal. So I list the critical issues they will be reject. The top one, one is to make your contribution clear. The second one, some submission, they are lack of the operational of the construct and the measurement indicators. Then we don't know the, what you are major about the phenomena. The third one is the small samples. As we, as I mentioned in the last slide, that small samples used in the smaller populations, you must collect a, 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 a bigger one. So for example, for the confirmation, then it's better to more than 100 or 10 times of the, the indicators. And the reflective the construct, formative construct I mentioned, and the mediation and the moderation, the second orders I mentioned before. And now let me introduce a little bit more about the problem. The EFA vs. the CFA, some authors that use the both one to show the, in a sample, but you need to give us the reasons. Oh, the EFA is used for the exploratory, the CFA is used for from the phenomena method and the goal, the goal perspective, the different. And the next one is the HTMT, the SIMR, the PRS, SEM, the, the papers you should, at least you may show the report, the HTMT and SIMR right now. The hypothesis, this one I mentioned before, so I want to explain again. The last one that I'm so, I want to emphasize more here, the mix. So many also, they mix the regression, the Korean best SEM and PLS ACM. They didn't explain why. For example, they use the CFA to combine the factor and they use the regression. And we know the limitation of the regression, you should use the structural model, model to, show your results. And 
if we want to mix the, the those methods, especially the Korean based and payroll estimate, you may refer to my article part, published in the 2016. We explain the advantage and the disadvantage about the Korean based and the payroll S next. The correct use of SDM, I, I did SDM research more than 20 years. So I just introduced a little bit about the correct use, correct report. The first one that published in the 2013, the correct report of SEM papers. The second one, that if you want to do the model comparisons, then we have the nested and the not nested. You must show the different statistic here. That's about a Korean based SEM. The third one, they combine the Korean SEM and the Korean SEM. You can start is to explain the why use the PLS. The first one, that's the totally pure PLS in the paper. It includes the, the common method bus, response, non response. The fifth one, this is a very, very complex one and revealed by the uh, guest editor, the Hansler, that how to do a first order and a second order. And the measurement events, they use the MICAM procedure and the MGA. The next one. Next one. Okay, you want to do the second? You can skip a slide. Okay, the time is limited. Huh? Okay. Okay. Uh, the, great. Uh, great thoughts from Professor Xiao. Uh, good articles that shared by you. So, as a participants, you guys can take note on that. So, as well as the books, yeah. Don't forget the books, yeah. Don't forget the books. So, next, since we all know that publication in top tier journal are getting, you know, difficult, tougher, Professor Christian, this question is to you. Could you share with us on how to assess PLS SCM results? and how to provide more rigorous and robust uh, application in PLS SEM. Could you briefly guide us through the details of reporting? Next. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. But uh, now it's unfortunately my part to spoil the party. Even though PLS SEM is a silver bullet in many research situations, you should not, should not shoot silver bullets all the time. And before it comes to the assessment, it is super important that you look into the underlying conceptual model and the data that you use. First, when it comes to the model, I always tell my PhD students, 80% of the time that you spend on research is in the theory building and creating the model. And using a multivariate analysis technique simply comes on top for the validation. And in order to do this, you need to have good data. And um, even though PLS is known uh, to be to have advantages when it comes to small data, um, usually more data is fortunate. And you can play out um, the advantage of PLS when your population is small, but getting the idea that you do um, an analysis on Chinese consumers, but only have 213 observations and think you can get generalizable re results from that, that's usually not a good idea. And secondly, if we have see, as we have seen in uh, the chat already, there are so many questions. Um, how can I use higher order constructs? Um, what about moderated mediation and so on? These are already highly advanced questions and all these questions need um, a strong uh, conceptual underpinning. Why would you use a higher order model in the first place? I usually avoid using higher order constructs um, because it's uh, super difficult to conceptually set something like this up and um, the most work is in the theory building and the model um, that you are using. So my first call is um, be very um, clear in the model that you're looking at, spend most time on this, then collect good data and when you collect data, ask yourself what type of data you should have. 
So I often go to other countries, do workshops, and uh, then the PhD students um, show me um, their data and say, well, I did this uh, research um, on a remote country in Africa, and uh, do I get in a top journal with this? And then my question is, well, my answer is, well, unless there's a very good reason why you use the specific data set for this specific country, um, I would doubt it, because um, it's very difficult to generalize um, this, uh, these conclusions uh, to something that is attractive to a top-tier journal uh, published um, in, in the United States and uh, focusing um, on uh, the top research community, unless you have a comparison and, and other good reasons. So um, that is um, just uh, that my, my uh, call of notion and um, be careful. And uh, then the second call is, rather keep it simple than making it too complex. Even though um, software applications like Smart PLS are a tool that uh, democratize um, uh, multi-bread analysis techniques, open it up and make it easy to use, it's not simply about clicking, it's simple, uh, you need to understand what you're doing. And that's my second call, which I always give also to my PhD students. Keep it plain and simple, understand and know what you're doing, and rather avoid using a higher order model, rather avoid um, using um, a moderated mediation if you do not fully understand why you would do this in the first place, and then the technical part can be solved. And I also have seen in the chat a question about time series analysis. Many people ask about time series data and PLS these days. My first answer is, um, and uh, uh, question to them is, why would you use time series? It's just um, uh, yeah, a, a complex uh, uh, um, yeah, approach. Would you like um, to compare mean values across time? Would you like to compare um, coefficients um, from one time to the other? Or would you like to do both? And is it simply a comparison from the first point of time to the last one? Or is it just from uh, one day to the other? There are so many questions coming to this, and there's not a single simple time series analysis, and it's uh, in these regards super complicated, and you need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it in the first place. And then the technique is just an add-on, and if you understand um, the technique, um, it's easily to apply and, um, and usable. So when you consider all these elements, um, the assessment of the model, and coming to your original question, Jackie, is straightforward. Um, it comes um, in the first place um, to um, do some, yeah, um, some first checks if your underlying assumptions are appropriate. And um, a first approach could be, um, uh, for example, what Marco already addressed, there's a distinction between uh, formative and reflective measurement models. And if you consider a certain type of measurement model, you may want to run an analysis like the confirmatory tetrad analysis to see if um, the orientation of indicators um, is uh, as you assume. And um, you could do this as a kind of um, yeah, robustness check for your underlying theory. Or similarly, um, one paper which um, just got accepted, um, which Marco co-authored, um, is on the necessary condition analysis. Here it comes to the structural model and the question um, do we need to assume certain necessary conditions, certain relationships in the structural model, and thereby um, you get a certain indication that your original conceptual um, assumption sold. And um, given the situation, you then step by step go into the standard assessment of results. Um, that is well known. And there are many articles um, that write up the how-tos. Um, here's uh, one we just put on the slide, um, a recent one by Joe Hare, um, uh, Jeff Risha, um, Marco Zasch, that myself shows you when and how to use and how to report the LSSEM results. And um, you start with a measurement model, um, you apply certain criteria for reflective measurement models, such as internal consistency, reliability, indicator reliability, convergent validity or discriminant validity. And when it comes to formative measurement models, um, there's a whole set um, such as convergent uh, validity, collinearity assessment, um, and you would certainly look into the significance and relevance of outer weights. Once um, the measurement models are fine, you move on, and then you look into the structural model. And in the structural model, um, there are certain criteria like the collinearity among constructs. Um, you look into the significance and relevance of relationships. 
you assess the predictive uh, relevance. Uh, you use um, in-sample predictive relevance by looking, for instance, at the R-square value and the effect sizes. And you also look at out-of-sample um, predictive relevance by um, using, um, for instance, the, the PLS predict method and Q-square values. And uh, certainly a question that always um, has been asked in this context, what to do with the goodness of fit? Um, we usually don't include um, the goodness of fit, but um, sometimes um, reviewers ask for it. Or when you go um, particularly in a causal predictive direction of your research, um, you may want to address it. But it's usually um, it's a, a criterion that does not match the method very well. The method is um, focused on the prediction and the explanation. And here it's um, maximizing the explained amount of variance of the target constructs. And it's not like what the goodness of fit does, um, minimizing um, the discrepancy between your sample data and uh, the model implied covariance matrix. So it's a completely different goal. This completely different goal is followed by CBSEM, but um, PLS um, has um, more the prediction oriented goal. However, in certain situations, um, if the reviewers ask you or you would substantiate your uh, causal predictive character of your research, um, it's uh, certainly not harmful. And then it comes to the robustness checks. And um, when it comes to the robustness checks, um, we wrote up um, a couple of those um, and some of the hot topics um, in tourism economics in an article um, that looks into structural model robustness checks. There are certain elements and here in this particular article we address nonlinear relationships because that's a usual um, question. The underlying assumption of all relationships in PLS SEM that they are linear and uh, now you could challenge um, this question. For example, when it comes um, to a customer satisfaction, customer loyalty relationship, is it really linear or should we rather assume a non-linear relationship? And also you start um, with the thinking first. And when you think about it, here you would expect um, at a certain level, when we have reached a high level of um, customer satisfaction, that maybe customer loyalty would not increase as strong. And um, thereby um, you may assume um, a decreasing function or um, that the function would be flattening, even though it's still overall positive. However, um, Looking for nonlinear relationship is not a goal in itself, and um, we have seen some researchers just hunting um, for nonlinear relationship. And once they become significant, they say they found something. But here again, um, the question is: um, Is it really um, useful and meaningful? Of course, if you have a significant nonlinear relationship, which is not relevant in that uh, the nonlinear effect is so small. Um, that it um, doesn't contribute too much to the explanation, then um, the call is you may stick uh, with a more simple linear model and don't complicate um, these elements too much. And um, you have in these regards um, a substantiation more or less of your original linear assumption. So going into the sports of hunting for non-linear relationship is not good until you find really something um, which is substantive from a theoretical conceptual point of view and uh, from an empirical point of view. The other concepts, endogeneity, that is something to substantiate your cause to predictive relationships, a typical review call, and um, we now provide the answer to this. And so, Jackie, I know my last 30 seconds started, but just um, one uh, last reminder, unobserved heterogeneity, that's also something we address in the tourism economics um, article, that can be a strong threat to the validity of your results. In fact, um, if there's unobserved heterogeneity that you don't account for, your results may be invalid. And that's what Marco and I uh, published about uh, since 2008, and uh, even call for this as a standard means of evaluating your results and substantiating your findings. And um, to flip the coin, on the other hand, when you don't find unobserved heterogeneity in your outcomes, that even makes your theory and your concept stronger. So if you don't find anything, then, then you can come to the conclusion that you have generalizable outcomes um, that apply uh, to the entire population. Thank you. Great. So participants, you better take notes on these points as well as you know several new publication by Christian and Professor Marco. So yeah, please take note on this points and so on. So next. 
Finally, recent literature in PLS SEM has highlighted new terminologies like common versus composite uh, to use PLS or PLSC as well as CFA and CCA. You know, all these terminologies, all these criteria seems to be very confusing to us on when to apply these new techniques. So, Professor Marcos Sastet, would you mind to clarify for us regarding this matter? Thank you. Yeah, sure, uh, Jackie. Thanks. Um, well, in fact. It is really complicated, yeah. So um, even for us working uh, strongly in that methods field, it's sometimes very difficult to keep track of the various developments, simply because um, researchers use related terminologies to express different things. Sometimes they use different terminologies to express the same thing. Yeah. So it's um, it's very uh, confusing even for us. So what I want to say here is do, don't be too concerned if sometimes uh, it's a bit overwhelming. Yeah. But one of these things that has um, really triggered quite some confusion recently is uh, the notion of a, a confirmatory composite analysis or simply CCA. So uh, I think most of you will be familiar with the so-called CFA, so confirmatory factor analysis. It's really a standard approach that has been around uh, forever. It's simply uh, the act of validating uh, measurement models of constructs. So not in a full-blown structural model where you actually hypothesize relationships among these constructs, but really among um, or as in a standalone manner. Yeah, so you simply look into specific constructs and say, okay, is this construct measured validly as a sole entity? Yeah, standalone, not in the context of a larger structure model. So this has been um, around forever. And the CFA, confirmatory factor analysis, as its name implies, relies on factors. So a factor is simply a description of a way how you want to map something that we talk about, that we theorize about in a statistical model. So we let's say we talk about satisfaction with the seminar. This is something we conceptually talk about, but if we want to measure it, we need to somehow put it into a statistical model, otherwise we can't research it, right? And um, a fact is just one way of viewing how this concept can be put into a statistical model. And in a factor, and I guess most of you will be aware of that, well, we assume that there's some entity which causes some covariation, some correlation among the indicators that we use to measure this entity. Yeah, so um, there is something in the background and it causes this correlation. And because we can observe this correlation, we then try to infer on the underlying factor. This is kind of the logic, right? And this might sound familiar to you because this is what we refer to as reflective measurement models. Well, here are the arrows that link the construct and the indicators go from the construct to the indicators. So it kind of implicitly we're saying, okay, this is a factor. Um, in a composite model, it's a bit different. Yeah, in a composite model, uh, we say that the indicators uh, form linear combinations and together they generate the underlying factor or composite. Yeah, so to be very precise, we should talk about the composite here because it's a combination of different indicators which are somehow combined, some using some weighting scheme to put this latent entity into a statistical model. Different from a factor in a composite, we actually have values. So if you run a CFA, the values of the construct of the factor are unknown. They don't need to be known. In fact, um, there can be an indefinite number of different values that generate the same result, which is a bit troubling in some respect, but we're gonna get to that. So in a composite world, we are just using weighted, uh, <clears throat> weighted uh, sums of indicators to generate these composite scores, okay? And so here the logic is so the indicators form the construct. The arrows go from the indicators to the construct. But importantly, this only refers to how we actually put this latent entity into a statistical model. It's a way of thinking about data. How is do we actually compute the model? This is not necessarily related to the question whether something is specified as reflective or formative. So in a factor world, you can have a, have a reflective and formative specification. You can also estimate formative measurement models in, let's say, AMOS under uh, certain restrictions. 
Similarly, in PLS, even though kind of the logic how the composites actually get uh, computed in the model goes is almost a formative viewpoint, actually you can also specify reflective measurement models here. So it's these are two different things. Think about it as, okay, conceptually, how do I want to measure my constructs or my, my latent entities that I'm interested in? And then the second uh, thing we have to think about is, okay, how are these elements actually being computed in the model? And these are two different things. So because PLS and other methods like regressions using some scores or some other weighting or generalized structure component analysis, maybe you've heard about that, because these techniques are composite based, well, the CFA logic of validating them is not fully applicable. Yeah, so because we don't compute uh, latent variable scores, for example, CFA, well, then we cannot use the CFA. We have to use a confirmatory composite analysis, CCA. And that's where the confusion starts now, because when a, well, concept comes up and people know that, well, we cannot use CFA, we need to come up with something else, and we call it CCA, well, then there's confusion of how we should do that. Yeah, and the, the name, at least to my understanding, first popped up uh, formally in our organization research methods article, which we published 2014, uh, where this was first noted. But the first time ever that somebody really wrote down, okay, this is what a CCA looks like, that was um, in the uh, book by Joe Hare, a multivariate data analysis, which was published in early 2018. And his understanding of a CCA is similar to what Christian described earlier on and also what Professor Xiao described. Yeah, you simply, or not simply, but you run through these different steps of validating reflective and formative measurement models. Once you have established that these are reliable and valid, you move on to the structure model, looking into R square and PLS predict and all these things that you do. Well, this is one way of viewing the CCA, but a, a couple of months later, um, our colleagues like Florian Schubert and your Kanzler, which you might know, Theo Dijkstra, they published another paper, which I actually call confirmatory composite analysis, and there they take a bit of a different perspective. Yeah? So they say, well, when you want to validate something, it's all about fit. So we need to um, test the model as we would do it in a covariance-based world, using different types of fit measures that they actually uh, assess in this paper. Um, so, well, people can have different viewpoints, which is more appropriate. Personally, I'm more with Joe's approach. It's also what we document in our various uh, papers. I believe that, um, well, we can validate a model also without using these fit measures, also because they simply don't work very well. And uh, I'm more on the predictive side because I think we use these models for deriving managerial prescriptions. But you can also take the other perspective. Importantly, these two approaches don't differ that much fundamentally because they, they're not really like a CFA as we know it in the covariance-based SEM world. Because in a covariance-based SEM world, you can simply take one construct and validate it as a sole entity without anything else. This is not possible in CCA. We need to specify some type of nomological network. This is what we do or you do when you run a PLS model. You test the reliability and validity in the context of a model. And this is also what Schubert and colleagues do in their CCA paper. They also test the uh, composite in the context of a nomological model, which looks a bit different though. So I'm um, not going to go into too much details here, but actually these two views of how to validate something are not too far apart. The major difference though is that they say, well, you need to um, engage in model fit testing. And we say, well, Currently, we don't think that's a good idea, also because the metrics don't very well, don't work very well. And by the way, this is also something that their paper nicely shows. Um, actually, these metrics don't work reliably for more than 200 observations. Actually, they are not really reliable. You need up to 500 observations in several settings for these metrics to work very well. Personally, I think that's really taking away one of the main advantages um, of PLS. So whether you subscribe to the one or the other view, well, you have to make up, up your mind there. Um, but if you're interested in um, this uh, view uh, that, that we kind of advocate, I would suggest looking into this recent paper by Herr, uh, Howard and Nitzel published in the prestigious uh, Journal of Business Research. So here they um, 
explain uh, how to run the um, CCA in the context of a PLS model. If you are more interested also in learning a bit about, okay, what did I just described here with these composites and factors, take a look at our JDR paper, estimation issues uh, with PLS uh, and CBSM, where the bias lies. Uh, next, please. And um, if you want to delve into, let's say, um, the details, then you can also look into kind of the philosophical underpinnings of the comparisons between PLS and CBSA. And we published a nice paper here in a, in a German journal, which we might not know, Marketing ZFP. That's why I put this uh, link down there, which you can simply click. And if you're like uh, more interested in the hardcore uh, statistics behind that and some implications of recent um, new thinkings of measurement in general, Uncertainty. We published a nice paper in multivariate behavior research and uh, nature human behavior on meteorological uncertainty, which we believe has got pretty vast implications for the decision whether to use composites or factors. But that would go into too much detail now, so I'll pass this on uh, to the next speaker. Thank you. Well, I think more research to do. <laughs> more research from you guys, Professor Marco and Professor Christian. I think more research to differentiate the CFA, CCA, and so on. So hard work for you guys, not on us. <laughs> you just apply and use it. So uh, next, let us look into the third topic for today. And something that everyone is awaiting because uh, it's about current advancement of PLS and smart PLS.